do thank you so much for you. Lord, you're so good. And Lord, you are powerful. You are great. You're amazing. And you're gracious. You're merciful. And you're loving. You're kind. And you're patient. Lord, help us now to hear from you. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, speak to our hearts. We want to hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've seen over the last couple of weeks uh, how Paul has made a rock-solid case that salvation is not based on good works, obeying the law, uh, performing certain religious rituals, or even being born as a Jew. Uh, he's made it very clear. Salvation is by God's amazing grace through our faith in Him and, and in His Son, Jesus, uh, and His substitutionary death upon the cross for our sins. But, you know, like we saw a couple of weeks ago on Sunday, uh, you know, there's always those who, who the Bible describes as those with a corrupt mind that'll come to a very wrong conclusion, even concerning things within the Bible. And there were some that taught then in, in Paul's day that, hey, if it's all about grace and not keeping the law, if uh, sin doesn't matter, well then, hey, we can sin all we want because we're under grace. <laughs> and Jude addressed that actually too. In Jude 4, he said, For certain men have crept in, that's crept into the church, unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That whole doctrine that because of grace, uh, you know, we could just do whatever we want, that we want is antinomianism. Okay, it's a $10 word. Uh, did I say it right, Carl? Okay, he's, he's our resident theologian here. <laughs> but it's the false view that Christians are freed by grace from the obligation of observing the moral law. See, we're not under the law uh, as far as getting saved or anything like that. Uh, we're not under the law to keep the law to stay saved or to please God. But <clears throat> there is still a word called sin. It's still in the vocabulary and the teachings of the New Testament. And as we'll see, we've been freed by grace not to sin, but we've been freed from sin. And there's a big dis distinction there, huge one. In the middle of the second century, these false teachings were picked up by a group of people referred to as the Gnostics. They believed that all matter was evil. Anything in the material realm, our bodies, this carpet, the, you know, this pulpit, it's all matter, therefore it's all evil. All matter is evil, they taught, and only the things in the spiritual realm are good which led to two different distinct branches of Gnosticism. The first was since, well, since all matter is evil, we should have as absolutely little as possible contact with the material world. It led to asceticism, you know, that extreme self-denial, and, and sometimes even to self-abuse, to punish our, our wicked flesh. And, and some orders of monks, uh, you know, they espoused to this, and, and it's like they're, they're not allowed to laugh or to sing, uh, eat only bland food, drink only water kind of thing. But then there's that second branch that says, well, since all matter is evil, all the material world will be destroyed, then it doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. They'll be destroyed, so hey, party hardy. And that was the, the teaching that came out of all this stuff. See, at this point, as we saw when we were in chapter 3, there were people going around spreading false rumors that Paul actually taught that we should keep on sinning. We're under grace. Go for it. You know, and then in fact, you know, the more you sin, the more sin will abound, uh, you know, the more grace will abound. And the more you sin, you know, hey, uh, the more people, uh, you know, they'll see how, how awesome God's grace is. And, and so more people will come to Christ. And we read in Romans 3.8, he said, and why not say, let us do evil that good may come. 
as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. In other words, they deserve what, they're, what they've got coming to them. Now, Paul is going to address this whole concept of Christians continuing in sin once we're saved and how wrong it is. Look at the verse, first two verses of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? <clears throat> you know, the end of the last chapter, which again, in the original writings, uh, you know, the book of Romans wasn't divided into verses or chapters or anything like that. This is one continuous thought. And, and in verse 20 of, of chapter 5, he said, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And we saw it. the law was given to show how bad we really are as sinners without Christ. To show us our need for Christ by revealing to us all that God called sin. And where sin abounded, where sin was seen as so abundant, the grace of God was then seen as super abundant, much more abundant, because it removed all of that sin, no matter how much. So now Paul asked this rhetorical question that was either being assumed by those who wanted to keep on sinning once they were believers, or it was a question that was being asked by some of the Jewish believers that saw Paul's position as, um, you know, being freed from the law as opening the door to living a sinful lifestyle. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? As he says there, certainly not. <laughs> no way. Some, some translations word it, absolutely not. Uh, other translations word it, by no means. I like the old King Jimmy, God forbid. <laughs> God forbid that that would happen. As he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, the day we gave our lives to Christ, we were at the same time making the choice to die to sin, to no longer live for ourselves in order that we would live for God, that we could live to Him. We are supposed to be following Christ, right? And Jesus said, follow me. Well, if we're following Jesus, we'll be on a path of righteousness, right? Not a path of sin. Jesus never sinned. He, his path was righteous. So we won't be on a path of sin. We'll be on a, a path of righteousness, and we're to be dead to sin. And if so, then we can't continue to live in sin. It's just foolish to think otherwise, is Paul's point here. Then verses 3 and 4, he says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. See, water baptism symbolizes several things. And all the believers back then were water baptized. In fact, usually within days of conversion. You know, once they got saved, that was like sometimes just that day, hey, there's some water, let's go do it. And so they got baptized. And so he's making that point that you were baptized into his death. See, going down into the water is for identification with Christ. We're proclaiming that our Lord was, uh, was killed on the cross, that He died and was buried. That's one of the things that going down into that water does. It proclaims that. It's a witness of that. But the other thing that going down to the water represents is that we too are dead to our old sinful lifestyle. And we're buried uh, with Christ, that, that we're burying that old man or, or woman of sin, that old person that, that did their own thing, that followed sin. That's dead. That's buried. As Jesus died for our sin, we are now dying to our sin. But coming up out of the water, that proclaims that the Lord Jesus did rise from the dead, that He rose up out of that tomb. 
But coming up out of the water also says that from now on, we're going to walk in that new Christ-like life. And that's Paul's point here, that we should be walking in that new life. Verses 5 through 7, For if we have been united in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. See, if the reality of what we're proclaiming when we went down into the water, you know, uh, when we were water baptized, if the reality of that is true, that we are, in fact, or we're dying to sell, like Christ died for our sins, that we are joining ourselves to Christ in death, then certainly, he says here, we'll also be living like the resurrected Christ. While Jesus was living in his mortal body, think about this. He was completely sinless. He never gave in to temptation. He, he, he never gave in to sin. But his body was still subject to human needs, right? Thirst, hunger, uh, you know, <laughs> the need for clothing and shelter and uh, all that stuff. His resurrected body, though, doesn't require those things, right? Now, whoever has died, speaking of us, has been freed from the needs or the desires of our earthly bodies. So just like Christ's resurrected body is no longer subject to hunger, thirst, death, all that, or even the laws of physics, if we've died to self in a spiritual sense, if, we're, if we have considered our old selves to have been crucified on the cross with Christ, then our bodies then are no longer subject to or under the control of sin. See, dead people don't sin, right? We talked about that before, right? That if somebody was struggling with some kind of sin and they're laying in the coffin, no matter what that struggle was, you know, you, you can put whatever, you know, if they had a problem, man, they, they were hooked on heroin, you can put heroin in, in a coffin as much as you want, and they're not going to use it. <laughs> if they were alcoholics, you can put as much booze in there as you want. Not going to get a reaction from them. They're dead. You know, no matter what the temptation, if they're dead, then they're dead to that sin. The body's not going to be led by temptation and sin and all that anymore. In fact here, he says that, that the body of sin might be done away with. And what that means is that our sinful nature has been stripped of its power over us. Sin and our sinful nature both been stripped of power. Uh, one uh, definition words that as reduced to a condition of absolute impotence and inaction as if we were dead. See, if we've died to sin, then we're freed from sin. It's powerless over us. He'll, he'll get into that even more in verse 8. He says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Notice there, and don't, don't miss it, that word if. Now, if we died with Christ. See, eternal life is conditional. Not everybody is going to get to heaven. We must die with Christ. We must die to self, as we just saw in verse 5. To be united together in the likeness of Christ's death, we have to, to die with Him. But if we have, then we believe or have faith that we shall also live with Him. It's a package deal. <laughs> if you're going to live with Him, well, then you first got to die with Him. That, that's the deal. You have to die to self, live to Him. Because if we really believe in Him, then that belief will produce a change in us where we'll no longer want to be living the way that we used to be living when we are apart from God. We'll no wa longer want to do things that we know displease God. Instead, as the Scripture says, that when we're born again, He gives His Spirit to us. He sends His Spirit in us that causes us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Gives us the want to, the will, 
to do of his good pleasure, but also the ability to do what pleases him if we have been born again. And then verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. See, so get that, that, that once Christ died, then rose from the dead, he's not going to die again. He lives eternally because death no longer has dominion over him. The resurrected body isn't subject to death. Okay, so he's making that, that case there. Understand that. If, if you died and you rose again, like Jesus, he died and rose again, death has no hold on him, has nothing to do with him, no claim on him. Verse 10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. See, Jesus died once, he says. And, and folks, death, since the fall, has, has really been appointed for all mankind. Death, because of sin, has a hold on every person. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Once, once you have died, that's it. Death, death has done its thing. It can only get you once. <laughs> Jesus died once, he says, to pay for the sin of all mankind, thereby breaking its power over us, breaking sin's power. I like the way the New Living Translation words, uh, verse 10. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. <clears throat> so again, don't miss that, that Jesus died once. Once to pay for our sins and break its power over us. And as he says here, once for all. In comparing Jesus, our high priest, uh, under the new covenant to the old covenant system, the old priestly system, the Levitical system, the writer of Hebrews says in, in Hebrews 7, 27, that Jesus, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. There are those that teach the heresy that Jesus continues to suffer. And those that said that, well, when he suffered on the cross, that once and for all, really it wasn't once for all. He had to go and suffer in hell. Uh, again and all that. He had to go and suffer that way. But the, the death that Jesus died on the cross, folks, was sufficient to pay for our sins completely. The just for the unjust. When he cried out from the cross, it is finished. Folks, it was indeed finished. <laughs> there was no more suffering. No more dying. Once and for all. And then as he told the thief on the cross that repented, today you will be with me in paradise. Say, it wasn't three days later you'll be with me in paradise, or, or today you'll be with me in torment. No, it was today you will be with me in paradise. And then the Bible says, like in Ephesians and that, that when Christ ascended, that he led those that were captive in that, that heavenly holding place there, Abraham's bosom, that Jesus talked about in Luke 16, he led captivity captive. Uh, and now to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He died once for sins. He suffered once for our sins. One death for all mankind, and now Jesus is alive. And the life that he lives, he lives to God. Okay, He lives in complete fellowship and harmony with God. Bless you. <laughs> with God the Father. And he lives to serve us, and as we've seen before, he always lives to make intercession for us, but he, he does that because that's the Father's will. He's, he's living now in complete, total harmony with, with the Father. And, and then verse 11, he says, okay, you get that. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Okay? Likewise, you also, us, we should reckon ourselves to be dead indeed to sin. The NIV words it, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Or the English Standard Version words it, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, we can only reckon ourselves dead. Okay? Now this is, this is something that, uh, when you think about it, it's kind of a, an interesting fact here. <laughs> you know, you, you could kill yourself a lot of different ways, right? But crucifixion is not one of them. As somebody has said, it's the only way that someone can't kill themselves. I mean, think about it. You know, okay, if you wanted to, I guess you could do some kind of way of, of nailing your feet to a cross. And you could probably even nail one hand to the cross. But then what do you do with that one kind of thing? And who's going to raise up the cross for you kind of thing? Yet you can't do it. Somebody else has to do that to you, all right? But what we can do, what we're being told here to do, is not to physically crucify ourselves, but that we're to reckon or count or consider ourselves as dead when it comes to sin. And then, like Christ is now, we're to consider or reckon or count ourselves alive to God. Think about that. Think about the impact of that in our lives, how that is. If we really consider ourselves dead to sin and only alive to God. Paul, in talking about himself to the Galatian church, worded it this way in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How many of you guys are thinking of that song in your head from back from the 70s? I am crucified with Christ. Only me? Only my wife? Okay, Denny baby? All right. <laughs> A few of you. <clears throat> but think what that means to our day-to-day -day lives how we live that out. Verses 12 and 13, he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. See, that's how we're to live this out, by not presenting our, our members, which means the different parts of our bodies, whatever they are, that we don't present any part of our body to sin, but we're to present all of our, our parts to God for Him to use as instruments of righteousness. You know, we're to be, be instruments or tools in His hands to accomplish His will here on earth. Think about it this way. If one of your members, okay, let's say you used to, in your B.C. days, before Christ, okay, if, if your big sin was with your mouth, <laughs> you know, that you used to tell lies and you used to gossip. See, you were then presenting your mouth, you know, as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin. Go for it. Use these lips. Just go ahead, you know. And you'd hear some gossip. And you would want to tell a lie about somebody because you hate them. So you, and you, your mouth would accomplish that kind of stuff. Yeah. And now you and I are to consider our mouths as dead to sin. And so when the temptation comes, hey, they'd really enjoy hearing that juicy little tidbit of gossip that you just heard. Well, then you say, nope, <laughs> my lips are dead to all of that. You know, they are alive to God. They are dead to sin. So instead of, of using your lips to accomplish more unrighteousness, to accomplish sin, you use your mouth to, to, to present your mouth to God for Him to use by, like, preaching the gospel or maybe even rebuking the person that, that dumped that juicy tidbit of gossip on you in the first place. You know, maybe uh, exhorting them to, to repent themselves kind of thing, you know. If you had 
previously had a problem with stealing, okay? And, and, and now you look at your hands that you used to steal with and say, you're both dead to all that stuff. When temptation comes, would you see something that you would ordinarily take and stick in your pocket that doesn't belong to you? You say, no, you're dead. <laughs> My hands are dead to that. Yeah, they're dead to sin. Ah, but now they're alive. We present them to God. God, my hands are yours. You use them as, as you see fit. You use them for your glory, Lord. So you use them by serving him, by serving others in his name. You know, think about that. When, when people are serving a cup of coffee or, or soda or something out there at the coffee shop on a Sunday morning, they're using their hands. They're presenting their members, their hands, to the Lord to use for righteousness, to bless other people with. You know, when the folks back there in the sound booth are using their hands, you know, to mix the knobs or to click on the words up on the screen and that kind of stuff. They're presenting those members of their bodies as instruments of righteousness to bless the people around them, to glorify God with them. That's what God wants us to do. We're to present every member of our, our bodies as alive to God, only to God, for Him to use. They're dead to sin. If we would think about that all, all the time, whenever we're tempted, eh, no, no, I'm dead to that. You know, that part of my body's dead. We would be a lot more victorious uh, over sin. Verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, at first, that kind of was like, huh? That kind of doesn't make sense, but it really does. See, sin no longer has dominion or control over us if we're born again. See, we're dead to it. We're freed from its power. We're no longer under any law that points out our guilt, that condemns us, and that shows us how sinful we really are. As 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. We're no longer under the law, so, so no, no sin has, has any strength to hold us captive to its will. We're now under God's grace, the grace that sets us free not to sin. See? Grace that gives us the power to do what pleases the Lord. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Grace that gives us the power not to sin anymore. And remember, we kind of think of it this way. Remember what we saw last week? That we're no longer on Team Adam. That, that we're now on Team Jesus. And Team Jesus is powered by grace. Awesome team to be on. In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, certainly not. Certainly not. God forbid. See, when someone who professes to be a believer in Jesus tells you that they can keep on getting drunk, keep on having sex with somebody they're not married to, or any other sin, because, dude, we're not under law anymore. We're under grace. Remember this. Because we're not under the law, that doesn't mean that we should keep on sinning. He says, certainly not. God forbid. See, this, that's what immediately should go on, uh, through our minds when somebody tells us that. God forbid. Now, whether or not you should say that or not when they tell you that, you know, that's up to you. Let the Lord lead. But we do need to be ready to share with them this truth, that the fact that we're under grace and that law doesn't mean that we keep on sinning. It means now that because of the grace of God, we've been freed from sin and its power and the, the control it had over us, that we had to sin before. But now we don't have to sin anymore. We're freed from it. Grace has set us free, free from sin. In verse 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So think of it that way. 
Who do you present yourself as a slave to obey every day? Who do you wake up, you know, get your shower, get dressed, whatever you do to get out the door, and as you're ready to get out the door, who do you stand in front and go, reporting for duty, sir? Who are you presenting yourself to? You can't kind of think of it that way. Are you saying, Lord, I'm yours? I'm presenting myself to you today, Lord, to use me in however you want to use me? Or are you presenting yourself to do your own thing or to, to, to present yourself to sin, which, as he says here, will lead to death? See, if you present yourself to obedience, to obedience to the Lord, that's going to lead to righteousness. It's the same point that Paul made to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. See, sin leading to death is the same thing as, you know, sowing to the flesh, which leads to corruption. Corruption and death are really synonyms in this sense. But if you sow to the Spirit, if you plant seeds to the Spirit, if you are, are presenting yourself to obey the Lord, that's going to produce righteousness and everlasting life. If you're living in sin, then sin is your master, he is saying here. Whoever you present yourself to, that's your master. So if, if you're continuing in sin, he's not talking about stumbling one time in sin. He's not talking about, hey, you know, I was walking with the Lord real good, and then I tripped on a pothole. <laughs> you know, I stumbled. He's talking about practicing sin, living in sin, continuing on in sin. And so if, you, if you're living in sin, he's making the point here, then that's your master. It has control over you, and it will kill you. Isn't it wild that... And I know that this is the case before we came to Christ. And sometimes, as Christians, sometimes we can be deceived and think that I can mess with that sin. I, I, I can control it. I can handle it. it. It won't get the best of me. But every time we give ourselves over to sin, every time we say, well, I'm going to go ahead and do that for a while. And that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, man, that's exciting. Oh, yeah, everybody else is doing it. Hey, I'm saved by grace anyway, man. You know, God will forgive me. And then eventually that sin ends up controlling you. It ends up overpowering you, and you become its slave. That's the way it is. It'll kill you eventually. However, if you're living in humble obedience to the Lord, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that'll lead to or it'll produce righteousness. See, then at that point, then God really is your master. Think about what Jesus said in Luke 6, 46. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? See, Jesus said that there's something wrong there. If you're going to call me Lord, and you're not going to do what I say. There's a problem there. If you're living in or practicing sin, then Jesus really isn't Lord or master of your life. That's what Lord means. It means the boss, the master. If you're not living in obedience and you're living in sin, then sin is your master. And for every born-again believer, sin was the master of all of us, right? No matter how big the sin, ugly the sin, or cute the sin, or whatever, before we came to Christ... We were living in disobedience. Sin was our master. But not anymore. Verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. See, Paul and the other apostles delivered to the known world the true gospel. The true gospel of Jesus Christ, that form of doctrine that he's referencing here, that said that sinners must repent from their sins, turn to God in faith, 
believe that Jesus died for our sins, that He rose again on the third day, that He ascended into heaven, that He's coming again. And if we believe, then if we put our faith in God, then God applies His grace to our lives and we're saved. That's the form of doctrine that was presented to everyone in the first century by the apostles. Paul, Peter, John, James, all of them. That's the doctrine. That's the form of doctrine. And we see it throughout the New Testament. Just a you know, couple places I'll point out. Jesus said, remember Mark 1.15? The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Peter's very first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. After they were cut to the heart, after they were convicted of their sin, what should we do, they asked him. In verse 38, then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The only way that they would get baptized in the name of Jesus is if they had already put their trust in Jesus. So he's telling them to repent, put your trust in Jesus, and then prove that trust by going and getting baptized. And God will forgive you. In fact, He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. Or like Paul put it in this same book, in the book of Romans, in chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the Word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let me break that down just a little bit here. He says, the word of faith that we preach, in other words, we preach this whole gospel, this, this word of faith. Okay? It's salvation by grace through faith. And that's what he's saying here. And that gospel is that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, it's both the mouth and the heart together. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. Now, understand, when you say, I believe that God raised Him from the dead, you're saying a bunch of stuff there. If God raised Him from the dead, then first off, He had to die, right? And you're, you're admitting then that He died for our sins because God raised Him from the dead. If He just died for His own sins, if He was a false prophet, if He was a false Messiah and all that, then God would not have raised Him from the dead. It's kind of a package deal there. That when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, okay, He is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we're believing that He died for our sins and that He rose again from the dead because He paid for our sins, because God was pleased with the sacrifice, that He was in the will of God doing that. And, and so if we believe, He says, with the heart one believes unto righteousness. See, if you really do believe in Jesus, as He's made the, the, the whole case here in this chapter, all the way up to here, if you really do have that faith that you believe in Jesus, you've put your faith in God now, you're trusting in Him, that kind of faith, that kind of belief, belief there, he says, you'll believe unto righteousness. In other words, it'll produce righteous living in your life. It'll produce a change in you. I think everyone here knows what that is. That you were living one way before you were saved, when you believed in Jesus, all of a sudden, you start seeing it, oh, I shouldn't live like that anymore. Holy Spirit's convicted you. Stop that. Yeah, I need to stop that. I didn't, and, and all of a sudden, you got the power to do it. You know, before you were saved, you didn't have the power. You might have seen, oh man, I need to knock that off. But you couldn't do it. But see, you believe, and it produces righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. We sealed the deal <laughs> there. They preach that faith in Jesus. If one believes from the heart the gospel, then that will produce righteousness, not sin. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. These believers in Rome, they did obey that form of doctrine from the heart. They did believe. And because they believed, they were set free from sin. And righteousness now became their master. 
And it's a good master. Verse 19, he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of, of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. <laughs> He's saying, yeah, I can't get too spiritually deep with you guys. <laughs> you, know, you can't handle it, so I'm going to use just human terms. But here the sense is that as passionately as you pursued sin and lawlessness before, now pursue righteousness. See, with as much time and energy as you presented yourselves to sin, now present yourselves as slaves of, of righteousness for the purpose and the end result of holiness in your life. That's what he's telling us to do. And some of us really did pursue sin before, right? You know, <laughs> we're, what's, what's the next, you know, party I'm going to and this and that, and, we, and out chasing this or chasing that kind of sin. Well, he said, just as much passion as you put into that, put into following God, put into being righteous. Let righteousness rule you now. Then in 20 through 22, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. <laughs> think, think about that. When we were slaves of sin, we were free from righteousness. Righteousness had no say or sway in our lives, right? We're just going to do what we wanted to do. And think about the kind of fruit that we all had back then, right? What did sin in your life produce? <laughs> yeah, garbage, exactly. Corruption, destruction, ultimately death. It, it, if we would not have repented from it, then hell would have been what we would have had to, to end up with. That's, that's where we would have all ended, folks. I mean, that's, that's what it is. But now that we've been set free from sin, and as we yield ourselves as slaves, willing servants is the word, to God, that'll continue to produce holiness, which will eventually end in eternal life with Jesus. Or you can look at it another way. Look at verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the wages of sin, what we deserve when we sin, that's death, which is a reference to eternal separation from God in hell. But by faith in Jesus, we receive the free gift of God, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, and we oftentimes go right from Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, when we're sharing the gospel, right? And then we go immediately to this verse, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but understand what he's making the point here. <laughs> this is the way that we should be living. As Paul exhorted the Thessalonican believers, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. See, we've been set free from sin, not to sin. We've been set free to, to righteousness. And that righteousness produces the fruit of holiness. And the end of all of that is everlasting life, as he said, because the wages of sin is death. That's it. You know, the, the fruit is horrible. It's garbage, you know. But ultimately, there's hell to pay. Not to be crude, but that's literally what, what it means. That's the wages. But the gift of God, by God's grace, you know, God's grace by our faith in Him is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And so that's how we should be living. We should be living as presenting ourselves every day to God, saying, here I am, Lord, use me. My hands, use them for whatever you want to use them. My mouth, use, use my mouth for, for however you want to use it, Lord. Whatever it is, whatever the part of our body is that, that we're going to use, it should be for God's glory. Whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you so much that you have set us free from sin. Lord, help us to remember that. Help us to remember the next time we're being tempted to sin, that we would remember that we're dead to it, that our bodies were crucified, that we would reckon ourselves, that we would consider, we would remember that, that we, Lord, are as good as dead, that our bodies are dead to sin. They're crucified with your Son, Father. They're crucified. And now we live for you. The life we live, help us to remember that, Lord, that how we live now is to glorify you. May we keep that in mind every day, all the day long, that we're yours. You bought us with the blood of Christ. You redeemed us from sin, and now we're yours. And help us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen.